Thank you for joining us online today. My name is Steve Polk, Executive Pastor here at First Baptist, and it's an honor to welcome you to our online service. Uh, Today, you're going to hear a great word from our pastor. Uh, Here at First Baptist, it's really critical for us to focus on loving God, loving people, and making disciples. If you want to know more about the church, go to our website, fbcrockhill.org. Well, good morning, church family. And I want you to think about something. We were singing that song, and the God you worship right now is the same God Abraham worshiped, same God Moses worshiped, the same God Isaiah worshiped, the same God the Apostle Paul worshiped, the same God that James and Peter worshiped, and he's going to be the same God when you get to heaven that he has been and he is. God never changes. He is stable, consistent, and eternal. And that is a God worthy of our worship, don't you think? Yeah. Well, today we want to talk about getting stronger. We started it last week and we'll finish it next week. Getting stronger in our walk with God, getting stronger as disciples, stronger in our faith with Jesus. I know we're all at different places spiritually. Some of you are really strong in your walk. Others of you may be weak in your walk with Jesus. And then, you know, there are many of us who are anywhere along that continuum. Doesn't matter where we are right now, we can get stronger. We need to get stronger. The Lord wants us to get stronger. That's what we're going to talk about. So go ahead and take your Bible and open it with me to the book of Colossians, the book of Colossians. You know, in sports, teams want to get stronger all the time because they know if they don't, they'll get weaker. Same thing is true in our Christian life. So Paul writes this letter to believers, Colossians, lived in the city of Colossae. It's not a church he started. In fact, one of his missionary associates started that church. He had never been there. They had never seen him, but he knew about them. And he knew they were faithful. In fact, in chapter one, he bragged on them, said, I'm praying for you. But he writes this letter to encourage them to get even stronger, to continue being faithful. And we can learn some things from what he says to them. So chapter two, let's read together starting at verse one. Do you have your copy of God's word? Hold it up. Hold it up all the way. Amen. Bring it with you every Sunday because it's his word that we feed on spiritually. So chapter two, verse one, he says, I want you to know how great a struggle. Paul says, there's this, this spiritual battle inside of me. I have this on your behalf. And for those who are in Laodicea, a city not far away from Colossae, kind of like York is to Rock Hill. And for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged spiritually on the inside, having been knit together in love and attaining, here's a long sentence, attaining to all the wealth or riches that comes from the full assurance or confidence or conviction of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. And what is God's mystery? Christ himself is Jesus. We're going to spend most of our time this morning in verse 2. And then he says, in whom, in Jesus, are hidden all the treasures and wisdom, treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude or deceive or trick you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. You live the Christian life the same way you started it, by faith in Jesus. Verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ, walk in him. Verse 7, having been firmly rooted or planted and now being built up or growing in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to to Christ rather than according to Jesus. I want to begin by just reminding us of how important it is for us to keep getting stronger spiritually. And he tells us here that if you're going to get stronger spiritually, there has to be this want to in you. That when you are strong, no matter where you're at, 
Even if you're strong in your faith, there should be a desire. There should be a passion. There should be a hunger in us to get even stronger. Recently, the NBA draft was conducted. And usually in the draft, the teams that are really bad have really bad records draft earlier. And they're looking for great players, not just good players. When they draft, they're looking for a great player that can be the foundation on which they build a really good team going forward. But the teams that are already great, the teams that are already good, they're looking for really good players. But they're not looking for that great player that can turn their franchise around. They're already one of the best. They're looking for really good players that can plug holes. Maybe they need a defensive stopper out on the perimeter. Maybe they need another three-point shooter to bust those zones or to create lanes for penetration. Maybe they need a big guy in the middle just to block shots, protect the rim. They're looking for those good players who can make what is a really good team even better because they know if they don't continue doing that, they won't be great very long. That's a principle in life. It's true in your spiritual life. It's true of a church. It's true of me, of you as disciples, that no matter where we are in that continuum of spiritual strength and faith, we need to keep getting stronger because it's really difficult to stay where you are. When you start settling, when you start staying where you are without even knowing it, you begin gradually going backwards. You begin getting weaker. You always have to be working on getting stronger in your walk with Jesus Christ. Now, Paul in verse one, he says, I've got this struggle going on inside of me. He had never been to that church. He had never seen them, but he knew about them and knew they were a good church. But he said, I want to encourage your heart. And so what did Paul, he wrote him a letter. Where was Paul when he wrote this letter? He was in prison. Think about this. Paul was in prison being persecuted for serving Jesus. The end of the book of Acts, he's in Rome, in prison. And rather than throwing a pity party, he's wanting to encourage the believers in the city of Colossae. So he writes them this letter. And he says in chapter one that he had prayed for them often. And here's one of the things I want you to know. There are always people God puts around you who care about you, who care about your spiritual life, who are always wanting you to get stronger, always wanting you to know Jesus, always wanting you to be healthier, always wanting you to grow in your faith. Even if you have no interest in it, God always puts people in our lives and they will ask us questions. They will invite us to church. They will talk to us. And sometimes they will even irritate us because we're not necessarily having that same desire of wanting to push forward. And so God's going to bring people and put them in your life to stir up, to stir up your desire for growth, for getting stronger. Now, listen, if God's going to do that, like he did with Paul and these believers in Colossae, don't you think you and I individually should in ourselves have a desire to keep growing? a desire to get stronger, a desire to know Jesus better and more fully. In verse five, he said, I, I'm really rejoicing. I, I'm excited about, the, about your, your good discipline and the stability of your faith. That word good discipline is the picture of, of soldiers. They're standing tall and straight in formation, for inspection, they're at attention. It's the picture of soldiers in battle. And here's the front line, and that line is strong and, and it's holding, but the enemy is attacking and the enemy is trying to punch through, but the line is holding because if the line gives way, the army may lose the battle. And he says, when I look at you, man, you're holding the line. The evil one is coming at you and he's battering on you, but you're holding the line. You're being erect and straight and strong. And I want to encourage you hard because here's the thing. The enemy is never going to give up. He's going to keep punching, keep attacking, 
The evil one is going to do everything he can to get you to quit on Jesus, quit on church, to give up, to walk away. And you need reinforcement. You need supplies. You need to get stronger because the enemy's not letting go. And so Paul says, I'm writing this letter because I want to encourage you to keep getting stronger. In verse 7, he said, you're grounded, you're rooted, you've been planted. Keep building up. Keep growing. And so that's the, the first lesson is we need to get stronger no matter how strong we already are because it's necessary. We need it in this life. And for that to really happen, you have to want it. Do you want that? How much, how badly do you really want to know Jesus? How badly do you want to get stronger spiritually? Because, you know, what you want is what you will become. Life is that simple. What you want is what you will become. Lesson number two, we get stronger in community with other believers, in relationships, in small groups with other believers, not in isolation from other believers. Some people today wonder, well, is the church really important? I can be a Christian, love Jesus, and I, I don't need the church. Or maybe, yeah, I'm going to go to worship occasionally, but I don't need to connect with other believers intimately in a small group. I don't need a life group. I don't need a D group. I don't need to be serving with other Christians. I can do my own thing, and, 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 and uh, that's just wrong. Because you will never maximize your spiritual growth. You will never maximize your capacity to become more like Christ in isolation. There are things we do in isolation, things we do alone as a Christian that help us grow. For instance, we have our Bible reading plan that we're all participating with, but I'm sitting at the house by myself, and I'm reading the Bible by myself, and, and I'm writing in my journal what God is teaching me and what he's speaking to me and, and how I need to respond to what he's showing me. I do that on my own. There's also things we do with other believers. So we get together with our, our D groups. And, and I'm with these men, you know, four, five, six of us. I'm with these men. And I see some guys out here who've been in groups with me before. You know, and I have theology degrees. And, and my granddaughter Liliana was fascinated. There she is. <laughs> with my library, all my books. And I read in my journal, and then I get with these, these, this group of guys, and we're all sharing what God is teaching us, and one of them says something, and I go, wow, I've never seen that before. I'm a bigger believer in the priesthood of all believers now than I've ever been in my life. And, it, and, it, and it, it, it's, it's not just the things that we teach each other spiritually, and it's not just the encouragement and the praying for each other. It's the development of character. It's the development of the fruit of the Spirit. It's the development of patience and love and kindness and forgiveness. How do you learn? How do you learn to do those things in relationships? And if you're always running away, you're always blaming everybody else, then you're never going to let God smooth out those rough edges in your life. He uses relationships. Now, think about this. We, we know this in marriage. Monisa, we, we've been married 42 years. Did I get that right? She's having to think. She's at, I got it right. Okay, 42 years. How many of you in, in here have been married 50 years or longer? A few of you. 40 years or longer. Now, something all of us who've been married a while can tell you, you don't have a great marriage. You might stay together, probably not, you might, but you don't have a great marriage if you don't change over the years. If you don't learn and grow because it's in the give and take of relationships that our rough edges get smoothed out. Would it surprise any of you to know that I'm opinionated and outspoken? I used to be worse. <laughs> and I've, I've shared with some of you the story before. Monisa knows I'm telling this. Uh, I, I've shared with some of you the story before when we were dating, and I picked her up, and she, she was wearing those really ugly shoes. Y'all remember that? Any of y'all remember that story? 
I picked her up at her house one night for a date, and she had on what I thought were some of the ugliest shoes I'd ever seen. I mean, that's 43 years ago. I can still picture those shoes. I still think they were ugly. And uh, they, were, they, they had these little beady things on the top of them that looked like red eyes, mice eyes. I don't know what it was. They just, I thought it was ugly. And I told her. Yeah, I see you shaking your head, Matt. I told her. She didn't say much. I picked her up for another date about two weeks later, and she was wearing those same shoes. And I thought, she's doing that just to spite me. But I didn't say anything until later that evening we were back at her parents' house and she and I were sitting in the living room with her parents and I got to going the way I do and I said to her, Dad, Jack, don't you think those are the ugliest shoes you've ever seen? And he went, uh, but, uh, but, uh, I think they're okay. I went on. We were sitting together, I don't know, a week, two weeks later. And she said, you, you remember when? And I didn't. Because, you know, my family, we just say it. Well, oh, my family's like me and her family's not. You know, opposites attract, right? And um, she said, and I finally figured out what she was talking about. And she said, my mom was about ready to kick you out of the house. <laughs> I'm opinionated and outspoken. I've just learned how to do it a little bit better and, 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 and not say everything I think. Now, I've got stories about sweet Monisa. I'm not going to tell you, but I have them. <laughs> because no marriage prospers, grows in intimacy and love without both of you learning things about yourself that you Work on so you can be a better you, a better husband, a better wife. Because if all you do is blame your spouse all the time, guess what? <laughs> uh, I'm glad I'm not married to you. <laughs> you get the point? Same thing is true spiritually. How, how do I develop the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5? How do I develop love in 1 Corinthians 13? Over in, and, and we didn't read it this morning, but in chapter 3 of Colossians, if you, if you want to look at it, if I can find it here, verse, verse 12. Yeah, verse 12 of chapter 3, we've been, we've been chosen. He said, holy and beloved. He said, put on, put on. Like this morning, I put on my Kentucky blue jacket. It's a choice. He said, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. How do we learn to do those things in relationships? See, do you, do you know that in your life groups and at church, people are going to hurt your feelings? Sometimes somebody's going to say something you don't like. <laughs> God forbid, you don't get your way. They don't agree with you. And on and on and on we could go. And the, the tendency is sometimes we're just, I'm just going to, I'm going to leave. I'm going to run away. I'm going to live in isolation. I'm going to blame. It's always them, always them, always him, always her. Or like some people, you know, they, they, they church hop in 20 years. They've been members of 10 churches. You ever seen anybody like that? Here's the thing. You're never going to maximize your growth in Christ if you respond like that. Because the only way you learn how to forgive is to practice it. The only way you learn patience is to practice it. The only way you learn selflessness is to practice it. And the only way to practice it is by sticking with some groups, with some believers in some relationships. Because if you're not willing to look in the mirror and let God smooth the rough edges through the give and take of relationships, you're always going to be who you are or have been and never anything more or better. And so we want to get stronger. God uses community. Does God use my private Bible reading and prayer and 
Meditation, absolutely. But God uses relationships. Works that way for all of us, brothers and sisters. And that's, that, that, that's why he said in, in verse 2, not only do I want your heart to be encouraged, I want you to be knit together in love, knit together in love, knit together in love. That takes work. Intentionality. Self-awareness. Development of emotional and relational intelligence. Change and growth. And some people run from that because it can be painful. But it's critical, it's essential to getting stronger and to growing. There's a reason God puts his people together in churches. There's, there's a reason God tells us in Hebrews not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together is the habit of some. There's, there's, a Jesus, there's a reason when Jesus was equipping and training his future leaders of the kingdom in the church, he had them in groups of 12, and then even in that 12, he had three. Is you need that kind of small community if you're going to maximize your development as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So last Sunday we said, don't, don't give up, don't quit, don't run away. Today, put yourself in those kind of communities and do it consistently. Because when you run away, the person you hurt spiritually the most is yourself. Now here's the third and final lesson. I spent a little too much time on that one. But the one I just did is the most important one. Here's the third and final one. We grow stronger when our mind our thinking is shaped by Jesus and who he is, the truth of who he is, instead of being shaped by the false advertising of our culture, of our world. In verse 2, he said, I want to encourage your heart. He said, be knit together in love. And then there's this really, really long, run-on sentence with several words that don't make sense. You read it and you sort of get the sense, but what's he really talking about? Look in verse 2 again of chapter 2. He said... Um, attaining to the wealth or riches that comes from the full assurance or conviction of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. What, what is God's mystery? That is Christ himself. What does that mean? Let me do this. Explain what each of those words mean, then put it together for you. Okay? Okay. When he says wealth or riches, he's not talking about financial stuff. He's talking about the riches of God's wisdom. The wealth, the spiritual wealth that comes from knowing God and seeing things through his eyes and the blessings that are associated with all of that. When he talks about full assurance or conviction, it's the idea of being completely, totally Fully convinced about something. Convinced about the truth, about a person. Understanding means in your mind to put together all the pieces, all the ideas, all the puzzle pieces, put them together and it makes sense. It's like you've got a, a puzzle and you dump all the pieces out, and, 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 but, but there's the picture. You can see it makes sense. You're able to put it together. And then the true knowledge is the knowledge you have gained firsthand through experience, not just through listening to someone teach, not just through listening to a podcast, not just listening to, 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 to some television program, but through your own lived experience, you come to understand and to know this mystery of God, Jesus. What is he saying in that long sentence? He's saying this. That when you really get to know Jesus, not just know stuff about Jesus. There's a lot of people who know stuff about Jesus. But when you really get to know Jesus, 
See, there's a difference between, well, yeah, I know, and oh, I know. There's a difference. When you really get to know Jesus because you've taken the truth of his word and the truth of who he is and you've lived it, you've experienced it. You really get to know Jesus, he says. Then in your mind, the pieces of life's puzzle start coming together. And it makes sense. You begin seeing things differently. And and you wonder, well, why can't they see that? And you become convinced that, that who he is is really who he is. And what he says is really true. And when you reach that place, then the wealth, the riches of God's wisdom, of God himself, are available to you. That's why verse 3, look at verse 3. He says, in whom in Jesus are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's not saying God's trying to keep them from you. He's saying Jesus is the place where God's true wisdom is buried, and that's the place you need to dig. That the more you dig into Jesus, the more you get to know him, you finally start understanding God. And the pieces come together. And your faith is strong. Now hear me, brothers and sisters, hear me. When you run from the people of God, when you run from the church and you run from your life groups and you run from, and you run, you never discover those riches. That's why he talks about being deluded. Or in verse 8, being taken captive by this culture and the world. Because here's a tendency that I see today, 2024. People in their 30s and 20s and college students and teenagers, here's the tendency. When something happens you don't like. Or when you struggle with something or you don't understand something or you have a fear. You start doubting Jesus and you start doubting the Bible. And here's the tendency today. We don't dig deeper. We run away. We start listening to all these other voices. And the problem is you've never been an adult who dug into things of God like an adult because you're thinking, well, you were taught a little bit in Sunday school as a kid or as a teenager. Isn't that enough? No. Now, now, listen, you're an adult and you're depending on what you were taught as a kid, but you're going to go out over here as an adult and dig into all this secular stuff and all this anti-Christ stuff, but as an adult, you're not going to dig deeper into Jesus to get to know him then you will be easily deceived because you're only looking in one direction as an adult. And Satan loves to delude you. It's false advertising. How does it work? You know, Satan sprinkling a little bit of truth with, a, with some lies. How does it work? How many of you ever go to a restaurant, order your meal, bread comes with it, get a sandwich, and they'll ask you, white or wheat? You ever been asked white or wheat? How many of you say wheat? Come on, be honest. When I want to feel healthy, I do. And, uh, but here's the thing. It's false advertising. It's false advertising. Because wheat bread is not just wheat. Wheat bread has other grains in it, just a little bit of wheat. Unless it says whole wheat, it's not just wheat. And that's how a lot of advertising is. It's, it's not to tell you the truth. It's to get you to buy it. I mean, you want to understand how this works? How many of you watched the presidential debate Thursday night? You talk about false advertising. I mean, if, 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 if Trump and Biden were both Pinocchio, their noses would reach to the moon and back.
Both of them told you some truth. Both of them told you some lies. That's how, what he's saying here is that's how the culture works. Now, you know, one politician may tell more lies than the other, but what are they after? They're after one thing. What are they after? Your vote. Commercials, what are they after? Your business. Satan, what is he after? You. He's after you. So what do we do to combat this false advertising, this, this trickery, this deception? You dig deeper into Jesus. You dig deeper into Jesus. So let me ask you, are you doing that? Are you digging deeper into Jesus? Are you doing the Bible reading plan? Are you in a life group? Are you in a D group? Do you find yourself paying more attention to other voices, digging into other voices than you dig into Jesus? At the altar is a kneeling bench. And um, you're invited to get on your knees and say, Lord Jesus, I'm never giving up on you and I'm never going to quit. Lord Jesus, I haven't been digging deeper. I haven't been reading your word, and I'm going to. Or Lord Jesus, I've been isolating myself from small groups of other believers, and and it's not helping me. It's holding me back. And I need to get in groups. I need to go to a life group. I need to build relationships with other believers and quit trying to do this thing by myself. And And I need to be consistent. Maybe for you, it's, Lord, I need to quit blaming everybody else, and I need to let you start smoothing off my rough edges. Pastors are coming to stand here, and you're invited to come to one of them and say, I want someone to pray with me, or I I, I want to be baptized. I want to join First Baptist Church. And if you've never started your walk with Jesus, come to one of them and say, I want to start my walk with Jesus today. I want to invite Jesus into my life and be saved. I want to become a believer, a disciple, a follower of Christ and live the rest of my life with him and for him. So let's stand together and as we sing quickly on the very first word of this song, leave your seat, make your way to the altar to a pastor. Come right now as we sing quickly.